What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short, anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. to tell podcast episode 176 dexter henry brian fonseca here after a week off uh much needed week off had a lot of stuff going on also turned a year earlier it was my birthday uh turned 38 38 special uh is here (laughs) i didn't have to you know this was like the first year in a long time brian i didn't hear from people ask me the question that i think is absolutely stupid that they ask you on your birthday Mm. which is how does it feel to be 38? Oh, gee, I don't know. The same thing that felt 10 hours ago. When I was 37. <laughs> it wasn't that, not, not much of a difference. But, you know, people ask you that from time to time, and it is what it is. But, uh, you know, either way, feels good. Feeling great. Uh, got the second uh, shot of the vaccine done recently. Uh, came through that fine. Not really any complications or symptoms. It was actually worse for me on the first one. Mm. So feeling good on that regard. We're in May now. Uh, NBA playoffs coming up, a lot of stuff coming up. How are you doing, man? I had my first shot last week, actually the day before uh, we recorded this. Um, you know, felt pretty bleh, but it wasn't it wasn't severe uh, in compared to some of what I've heard otherwise. Now, I'm going to get the second one in two weeks, so we'll see how that goes. Because <laughs> I've heard I've heard different things about how eventful that one could be, but you know, otherwise, um, alive and kicking, doing what I can. What can I say? Yeah, trying man. to stay busy, man. Just trying to stay busy. <laughs> trying, try, trying to stay busy. Uh, things starting to open up. Uh, too soon. Maybe too soon. For too soon. Things. We're jumping the. We're jumping the gun. We're about to fuck this up. Numbers were going down, and now everybody's like rushing to get things open because everybody's, you know, oh, the economy. Oh, we got to do things. Oh, we've been in the house for so long. And as somebody who, one, is interested in, you know, the health of like the public, and two, is also an introvert, I'm not trying to rush to fucking run outside. I don't know what is this, you know, fast, like, let just, can we actually be good first? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. we're just starting to open things, and it's like, we're, we, we need more people like vaccinated and healthy. I and, agree. Like, I don't understand this. So y'all could go outside May 19th or July 1st or whatever the fuck. I'm not. I, I, I'm not. I'm not in a super rush to do it. I'm not saying I'm not going outside. Um, I will go out and do things on my birthday. I went out and it took a nice walk and relax and did, do, you know, those kinds of things. I mean, you should be getting out to get fresh air. Yeah. Well, that's I'm different. Sure. I, I I'm that. talking about like, now they're trying to stuff people in all these different events and shit. Like, we ain't and doing that. I, I, I'll go I, someplace I, to eat soon, but we, yeah, we ain't yeah. doing I, all that. I'm actually, I'm actually in a couple of days, some friends that uh, wanted to take me out for my birthday and did it. This is two separate people, but hanging out with each of them, uh, at some rooftop establishments that will not be crowded. That's that's the extent of where I'll go. Where I, you know, one, and this is my other rule. And I don't yeah. if, you, if you don't have this rule, that's fine with you. If you if you ain't got if you ain't got if you're not vaccinated, we ain't hanging, right? Yeah. Like right. <laughs> this is not yeah, gonna yeah. happen. <laughs> if you don't have the vaccine, we ain't really gonna hang like that. Unless I know you are living your life the right way. Like you got to be living your life. The right way. I know you're not out there running craziness, doing all kinds of craziness, right. hanging with people in you know 50 million bars and stuff like you know. But I mean, it's not open like that in New York. But I'm still not. I'm not personally comfortable with like sitting in restaurants, indoor spaces, outdoor spaces. Yeah, like I'm even fine. I think we talked about. This. I'm fine with going to a Mets game at some point later yeah. this year. Yeah. Um, I would like to do that as more people get vaccinated, which is to Brian's point. Right. Um, August. I, 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 think, I think when you see that happen, you'll start to be safe. But you're starting to see places. We saw the Atlanta Hawks announced today that they're going up to 45 percent capacity uh, for their home games in, in Georgia, in Georgia. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> Georgia, Florida, Texas, you know, yeah. we, we, we've got oh, Flo- Florida. Don't even get me started on fucking yeah. Florida. Oh, my yeah. God. So, you know, none of this is, is sort of shocking. 
Uh, my concern is, you know, in those places, are people getting vaccinated it, it, enough? We, we need to start really thinking about moving towards things. This is where I agree with Brian. When more people are vaccinated, when we are closer to herd immunity, it's, it's hard. it feels wrong to be talking about some of this stuff because we so desperately want to go back. And it's like, yo, man, there's a lot of stuff we don't know with all these other strains and stuff out there. And this could go right back in the other direction. So I just wish people would keep that in mind yeah. as they do it, you know, and, and you know, you got to do what's best for you, but just keep in mind to be safe. You know, got to continue to, to be safe. Yeah. So, I, I think I saw, I think I even saw a report that some scientists were saying that herd immunity might not even be possible um, at this point because like more people need to get vaccinated. I don't know. We got to do more research on that. I also think it's going to be somewhat regional because you have a lot of parts in the South where people are like, you know, oh, I want my freedoms. I want all this bullshit and they won't get the vaccine. So therefore, it's like they're going to keep opening up and then people are going to keep getting sick and perhaps worse. And then a lot of the places I see that where people are getting vaccinated are New York, Rhode Island, like places in the Northeast. I'm like, oh, that that doesn't surprise, and other places as well. But that doesn't that also doesn't surprise me because we saw who went red, who went blue during the election, and we kind of know like all these things are connected together, you know. So, nah, no, no, no doubt, no doubt about that. So, <laughs> this this was kind of a random conversation Brian and I had. Uh, I don't even know. It was a couple weeks ago. Brian brought this up to me. Brian, I was let you tell it because you brought it up to me, and I was like, "Man, this is a really good conversation. We kind of got to discuss this on the podcast." And it really deals around. I will start before you start. I'll say this: Yeah, there's always this talk in sports about who's the goat, who's the greatest of all time. We have to sort of define this all the time. And then there's one network, what I won't even mention, that last year try had a game. I think there was a game between Tom Brady uh, with the Buccaneers and Aaron Rodgers with the Packers. And they had something with the goat versus the boat. So the greatest of all time versus the best of all time. And I just let out a loud boo because that was so corny. Goat versus the boat. Like, <laughs> really? Like, who do you know that says boat? I never met anybody in my life that was like, yo, man, he's the boat. Ever. Like, never. It's, it's never happened. So the fact that somebody is doing this and saying this on the network, I don't know what producer came up with that. Uh, but I'll take a line from LeBron James. He said the person that came up with the playing tournament should be fired. Maybe that person should be fired. That was pretty whack. Um, but there's always a lot of talk about this. And then you brought up something to me about how the disparities sometimes between the people who are considered a GOAT isn't, uh, might be great in some sports and might not be great in other sports. So to tell, tell the people how you came up with this because I thought you brought it to me. I was like, huh, that's very interesting. I was trying to remember what the story was, but it was something I had sent you. And I, you know, I only send you the ones that I care about because, yes, because yes. I don't send you everything. You know what I mean? Yes, like, yes. <laughs> because I only post the ones that I care about and I don't post that much of them, but there was something I had written. And along the way, I mentioned Wayne Gretzky for, for whatever inexplicable reason. And I do a lot of random oh, mentioning in certain and certain things. I, I, yes. And I was shocked. Yeah. I was shocked that you, you had asked Wayne me Gretzky like, in the story. Yeah, and I, I was like, did you, was this, did you come up with this on your own or were you sort of nudged to put Wayne Gretzky in the story? I think because, you know, Brian, Brian likes the violence, but he's not really uh, rushing to mention the hockey, shall, yeah, shall, shall right. we say. But then I was like, nah, I, I did it because that dude was cold. You know what I mean? Like, and, and then we got into the discussion where I think Wayne Gretzky is the only person in a sport who is definitively the best ever and there's no other argument like this is somebody who has more assists than anyone else's points in his sport like if you look up his numbers they're ridiculous in every other sport there's a debate that was basically the basis of what we were talking about in tennis there's a debate basketball there's a debate in football in wrestling in boxing and mma it doesn't matter there's a debate in every single sport and there's like you know good debates like you can have the jordan versus lebron thing realistically you could throw kareem in there in women's tennis you could have serena williams versus whomever like it's debatable across the board and in football don't even get me started because you know how do you weigh quarterbacks versus position players and all these mm -hmm. different factors but in hockey it's wayne gretzky and i think that's the only sport i can really think of at least off the top of my head that like really has that disparity between him and whoever number two is Gordy Howe or somebody like that. But Wayne Gretzky is definitively the GOAT in, in hockey and maybe the only definitive GOAT in any 
one sport, I would say, maybe. Ooh. And I thought about it for a while, and I couldn't necessarily think of one. And, of course, in hockey, I think you'll have some people who will mention uh, Bobby Orr, some, some people, you know. I, I, but This is the I most hockey we've ever talked on this podcast. Yeah, most hockey we've ever talked on this podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you came to see minorities talk hockey, this will shock you. Um, yeah. I, I would argue that in the sport of soccer, for a lot of people, it's going to be – it's one or two guys – but I don't but it's think, still two. It's still two, but I think the gap between the two, not the two, the gap between those two and everybody else. And I would actually say I think one is more like one recently passed away, Maradona. Maradona, yeah. Um, and the other one I'm assuming is Pele. Pele. But I think Maradona more because of what he accomplished on the world stage in World yeah. Cups and, you know, what he means to Argentina and the sport. It, it's, I think he's the goat of the goats. But Pele for his flair is up mm. there too. I think there's up there for different reasons. But I think if you ask most soccer purists, they're going to say Maradona unquestion unquestionably. Are people throwing Messi or Ronaldo in there? I mean, they're up there now for sure. There's no like, doubt like about realistically it. throwing them up there. Because I feel like that's a I mean, soccer's tough too, because like just the way the, the just problem, the way the sport is. The problem for both of those dudes is like if both of them do the international World, winning. If, yeah, if they want a World Cup for their country, they yeah. might, you probably say they're there. Like it's going to be hard. But if like somehow I don't see it, but if Messi or Ronaldo won one at the next World Cup, then happen. I think they're. I don't think it's happening either. No, um, they're past their prime. Definitely not for Portugal. No, and I don't think it's over Argentina either. Yeah, but. But he yeah. got there too, but then you know they ended up losing. So yeah, I mean that's that's going to be held against them. But even that, I think like that's one of the famous debates is Diego Maradona and Pele. And I'm just not really sure. Like you, you I, there's not one definitive over the other, even in that sport. If I were to jump to like boxing, for example, you know Greg wrote in the chat Floyd Mayweather, and I don't think it's like super definitive because people will give you the Muhammad Ali argument, people will give you the Sugar Ray Robinson argument. You know what I mean? Like people will do that. Uh, people will even go as far back to say Joe Lewis uh, is in that discussion somewhere. Um, Roberto Duran, I probably wouldn't go that far, but some people would probably throw him in mm. there. Um, you know what I mean? Like, and then you get guys individual peaks. Like I think Peak Roy Jones Jr. is as good as anybody ever. But w- I mean, he obviously wasn't – he wasn't able to stay, like, as that same dude because then he boxed for way too long or whatever. And that's the other thing that makes boxing a little complicated is, like, you know, Sugar Ray Leonard, for example, has a couple losses at the end of his career that, like, eh, do you really count those, whatever, whatever. Like, Roy Jones Jr., people will remember him for being, like, 49-1 and one and undefeated other than the DQ before Anthony, uh, uh, Antonio Tarver ended up knocking mm-hmm. him out shockingly. And then he was never the same really after that. And the Glenn Johnson one just made it worse, but like he, his, if you look up his current record now, he's like 64 and eight or something along those lines, which tells you he had like 20 something fights post his prime. So boxing a little bit is a little bit more weird for this. I would feel inclined to say Floyd and Manny Pacquiao is also in this discussion as well. Obviously I would feel inclined to say Floyd Mayweather might be, but it's also hard in boxing because there's weight classes and MMA has those same challenges. I think I think that's the challenge in boxing. And I think boxing, its history always is gonna to skew towards the heavyweights because that for a long time was such a dominant division in boxing. It is clearly not anymore, uh, as we've seen if you've been watching the sport of boxing. But I think that it's always gonna lend more to the heavyweights. I mean, for me, like and a lot of that is what your eyes see and tell you, like. And, and Mayweather is going to be hurt because he wasn't a power guy. He didn't knock people out. That's not, he's more of a defensive fighter. And I think that hurts how people feel about him being the greatest. So I don't think he's ever going to win an argument in terms of against yeah. Muhammad Ali, who just had the power and the flair and then refused to go to the war and then came back. And all, Muhammad Ali has all the social stuff around him too that he's iconic for. Not saying that that should matter about what we're talking about in the ring. But he's got all that around him too. That I think that's hard to beat. Joe Lewis, what he what he meant to black folks, <laughs> just yeah. becoming heavyweight champion in the world. I think that's it, it. Those stuff that stuff matters too. But I think it's it's really hard to do for somebody to beat a heavyweight in boxing. I just don't see that happening, um, unless you have 
just another class of boxing with somebody so good, which you can argue like Floyd, um, and has fought in different weight classes among different opponents. But I think also with Floyd, I think that we remembered is like he, <laughs> I'm being nice here, he carefully chose his opponents. Right. That's that's and, something I was going to mention. Yeah. And you're not always necessarily sure he went to fight the best person. Yeah. Um, for me, the best person, my, the most the most talented person my eyes have ever seen in the ring wa watching in, in the heavyweight class. I can go into other places like Felix Trinidad and play other, other people who I absolutely loved at their class. But Tyson at the heavyweight class, watching him at his his peak Tyson was just crazy. I don't think he was good as a fighter as Ali or probably Joe Lewis in terms of technical skill. Yeah. But his power and speed. Yeah. Man, we we still we still can talk about how much you want to get punched in the face uh, by Tyson. How much you would get paid to do that? You know, you still would, would consider what what it, how much you would take because now at his age, it's still a. I don't even know if I would do that. I don't know if it's worth the money for the reconstructive jaw surgery I would need. But depending depending on how much money I would consider it. You know yeah. what I mean? But but like there's I, a price. There's always a price, man. There's always but you're, a price. And you're right about like that's the thing I was gonna say about Floyd Mayweather is just the uh carefully choosing <laughs> the opponents and you know not fighting Manny Pacquiao in twenty ten when we first heard about this, but doing it in twenty fifteen instead. Like those sort of things would probably be held against them too, although I still think that he's at at least in discussion. Even on the women's side, it's debatable because you have Ann Wolf, you have Clarissa Shields, you have Leila Ali, like you don't really know. You know what I mean? And you have uh, in, in in mixed martial arts, there's like a George St. Pierre argument. There was a Demetrius Johnson argument. Uh, he just lost recently. So I'm not sure uh, if people are going to continue to do that. John Bones Jones still has a case. If you want to go on the women's side, Amanda Nunez has a case. Like it's all over the place. And there are other fighters that I'm probably leaving out just because we're doing this off the top of our heads right now. But right. like it, it, in, it, and in fighting in general, it's just difficult. Um, and in other sports, it's like if we go to tennis, for example, I'm probably not the one to, to be the expert here. So, Dexter, I'm going to toss it to you. But, like, from what I understand, a lot of people consider Serena Williams being the GOAT. But that's also debatable because there are other women there. And then on the men's side, I, from what I understand, it's like a bigger debate, an even bigger one. Yeah, I think it's a bigger debate on the on the men's side than it is on the women's side. I mean, for me, I think Serena – to me, it's not. I, I think Serena, the the gap should be there, right? Like I think there's a gap, and I think it's because what she's done in the modern era against more athletic women, playing more tournaments in different places. How many top, you know, even if the ones she's won, you know, she's still one away from tying Margaret Court's record. But Margaret Court didn't really play that many people. She didn't play. In his uh, many grand slams, it was a much different game then. So, what Serena's accomplished winning 23 in this era and against the competition she had to go up compared to Margaret Court is not even comparable. You know, it's, re it's really not. And I think, you know, tennis is one of those sports where it's like, <laughs> or any American sports where you excluded groups of people from playing in there. Like, I, I, you know, some of your numbers in that are, are juked. And we have to really talk about that, right? Especially when we're talking about individual sports like boxing was juked to the point because they weren't letting uh, people of color fight, right? Baseball wasn't letting people of color play. Uh, you know, tennis wasn't letting people of color play. And and so golf, that's a whole nother story. Um, these stuff where people of color didn't even have access to. So you have to ask the people that had all those numbers early in the sport, like how good were they? Right. Like like really, how good were they uh, when it wasn't as open to many people? I actually think now, to some degree, when you look at a lot of these sports and how they're opening up more and things are opening up more for people, you now have to really be like, oh, like, yo, this is harder because there was a whole subset of people that they were able to ignore. You know what I mean? Who knows who could have been? This is for any person of color. You don't know what your ancestors or any person with the potential what they could have been because of racism. Racism held so many people back from so many different things. So seeing Serena dominate the way she has in this era where she's gone up against such great competition. I mean, yes, you can talk about Steffi Graf. You can talk about Martina Navratilova. Uh, you know, my mom, rest in peace, loved Martina Navratilova. But even she told me, <laughs> it was a big tennis fan, she knew Serena was 
surpassed her in terms of just what she could do on the court. And Martina Navratilova was a bad woman. Bad, but she didn't even have Serena's strength, speed, and just the, the way she could just dominate. You know, now you're looking, and we talked about this before, we talked about this with Michelle Yu when she comes up here who loves tennis. You talk about looking at how that that torch possibly could be passed to somebody like Naomi Osaka, who might who might very well pass what Serena is doing. And, you know, and it looks like in women's tennis, the competition is starting to get even stiffer. So the accomplishments that someone like Naomi Osaka may do might even be greater when you're looking at this. And, I, yeah, so for me, pers- it's funny. I agree with you, B. There's no gap like Wayne Gretzky. I agree with that completely. There's no gap like Wayne Gretzky. But I actually feel like, and I know people aren't going to agree as much on this, but I think the gap for Serena and everybody else is bigger than people give it people credit for. I think some people are just uncomfortable saying that because a black woman came in and dominated the sport. That's really <laughs> I think they're uncomfortable saying it. But I do, th- and that's no disrespect to Steffi Graf and Martina Navratilova, but Serena is leaps and bounds better than them even though as great as they were, I think she's leaps and bounds better and is definitively the greatest women's tennis player of all time. Tennis, you should be able to do this in a way that you can't in most other sports. Because, like, <clears throat> in boxing, we talked about weight classes. and MMA, there's weight classes, though not as many as boxing, but there's still weight classes. So it's hard because you're talking about pound for pound and all these other factors, and you can't have, like, Demetrius Johnson, a flyweight fight, John Bo Jones, who's a light heavyweight and about to fight a heavyweight or whatever, like you just can't, you're not able to stylistically do Floyd Mayweather, Muhammad Ali, who would win because that just doesn't happen. And in tennis, it's just every man or woman for himself. I feel like you should be able to, to sort of have these distinctions in a different way there. Where it gets more complicated is in football or in baseball, for example, because there are entirely different things. Like you're only playing one side of the ball on each sport. You're either a pitcher or a hitter in baseball, uh, in in baseball, and in football, you either play offense or defense. You're not playing both unless you're right. like in high school, and that's a totally different thing. And then, in, in that's why I don't think that like, and we've talked about this before. I don't think the best football player ever could be a quarterback because you have to rely on so many different factors to go right in order for you to have the time to make the good decisions that you're supposed to make. I, if, what, if you have if you have no offensive line, you're cooked. It doesn't matter how quickly true. you can release the ball, how good you can throw. If you don't have any receivers who can get open, it doesn't matter. Like there's only but so many times you can throw them open. I don't think that the goat in football, they, you could have a goat quarterback. I don't think the goat player could be a quarterback though. I think those are two different discussions. Like in I, terms of in terms of the best player ever that I've seen probably with my eyes offensively, I don't see how it's not like a Jerry Rice or somebody like that, right? I I, I think in fo- I think fo- I agree with that point in football. I just wonder how much it's changing because the quarterbacks can do more now or they're letting the quarterbacks do more, right? Like they're not, they're, you know, teams are somewhat going away from your traditional stand in the, the pocket quarterback and throw. That means the best of- player ever can't be a pocket passer. That's what that means. <laughs> I don't think so. No, and that's what no, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I don't think so. I don't think the best player ever could be a pocket passer because at least with the dude who has the option to run and throw, over time, if you're decently good at it, I know that you what you can do so much more for your team. So even if your offensive line is shitty and you're running for your life, if you're really good with your legs. I know what you can do for your team. I can see that. I can see that you can throw, you can run, you can make a variety of things happen for your team. If you're a pocket passer, and as to your point B, you're behind a shitty offensive line, and all you're doing is waiting, waiting, looking through your options, and you get sacked, well, I mean, that hurts you. It doesn't mean you're not good. It just means your line is shitty, right? Like, it doesn't mean that you're not good, but your lack of ability to do more can prevents you from being the best football player, the greatest football. I see, I almost said both. Almost said boat there, man. Ain't doing no boat on this show. <laughs> our best of all time. The greatest of all time. It prevents you from doing that. So I, I think there's a case for quarterbacks as they get evolved. But a lot of that has to do with, if we're really being honest about that, is the NFL, we've seen more black quarterbacks. Is the NFL allowing to do that? We just saw what happened in the NFL draft with Justin Fields and the team that I don't root for anymore that was picking number two decided to pass him over and go for a stand-in-the-pocket quarterback. Didn't necessarily agree with that move. But Who has some uh, Twitter stuff in his uh, arsenal in his past that you can go look up. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I, I, I will say this. I, I still think there's a bias in the NFL that and coaching and scouting that longs for that standing in the, the pocket quarterback and doesn't realize the game is evolving. Um, and, and I think it's disappointing because some guys still get looked over, sadly. And I'm like, when are we going to learn? A lot of y'all didn't take – sorry to turn to the football conversation – didn't take Lamar Jackson, didn't take Deshaun Watson. I know he's got a lot of problems going on right now. Justin Fields, again, drops to, to Chicago. And you know what? I think Justin Fields is going to be good. Me too. I think a lot of people are going to regret too. not taking him. Yeah. And, and the reason they didn't take him, they won't be honest, is because of the stupid biases they have still about black quarterbacks or running quarterbacks. Um, you know, but y'all find a way to make Josh Allen work. So, you know, right. I, 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 I don't get that. But to your point, yeah, I think that it's going to take a specific type of quarterback to be considered GOAT. And yes, I don't think that quarterback is necessarily going to look or be like Tom Brady. And that's no disrespect to Tom Brady. I'm just saying as sports evolves and things evolves, if you're going to look at a quarterback that's the GOAT, they're going to have to be, they're going to have to be able to do a little bit more than just stand in the pocket. I just don't see that being the thing anymore it, it would it would basically have to be mahomes it would have yeah, to be mahomes but that's the evol- look sports evolves right and that's the evolution of the game and how we look at greatness like the our standards for greatness is going to evolve i talked about this with serena right like if someone is to surpass serena they have to dominate a high level of competition they have to bring that strength power speed play all over the court variety of different shots you got to have it all in your bag. You can't just – I think sports in a whole is changing this way. Like, you can't just be good at one thing, right? Like, that, should, that doesn't get it done because athleticism has evolved. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's boxing. I don't care if it's MMA. You know what I mean? You can't just have – Or I, I writing or being right? on right. air or yeah. any of these things. You can't just have – you can't just write. No, that's true in whatever you do. And, and I, whatever I, you I, do. I try to tell this to young journalists. Same. Brian knows I've had this conversation with him, and Brian and I have much had this conversation, even had this conversation with our producer, Greg. Clearly it worked. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot be into one space. If you, want, if you want to be the GOAT, like if you think highly of yourself and you want to be the GOAT, don't settle for being the boat. Be the GOAT. If you yeah. want to be the GOAT, then you got to have a lot of things in your bag. You got to be able to, to do a lot of these things. It applies to everything in life. And so it's interesting <laughs> when certain people around certain sports will try to narrow it down to this has to be this way. This person has to play this way. Remember when you couldn't win with a sp- scoring point guard, Brian? You'll yeah. never win with a scoring point Jump guard. Jump shooting team, all and those now, things. And now everybody would love to have a Steph Curry. Only that Steph is a dime a dozen or a Dame Lillard, right? Like those are scoring guards who can get off their shot from anywhere and everybody would love them on their teams. So it, it's interesting how narratives change and, and people say it all the time. I wish people would accept that. But no, nah, man, the, the, the criteria of being the GOAT is, is constantly shifting. And that's fine. Like I think that's a good thing for sports. I don't think that's a bad thing for sports at all whatsoever. Like – it, and it's okay. I want to say this to people as a as the older person on this podcast. It's okay for stuff to evolve, man. It's okay for somebody else is going to come along and be better than something you saw before. It's going to happen. I don't like when old people just stand on this hill like this person was the best all time and nobody will ever, nothing will ever be better than that. Like, no, nah, man. Like, I love The Wire. The Wire is my favorite show of all time. I think it's the greatest drama of all time. Someday... Somebody will make something that is better than the wire. And I can't wait to see it. Some people you know, some happens. people some people are saying it's snowfall. I, which so, I have not seen Snowfall yet, so no spoilers. I do funny. plan on watching it at some it's point. It's funny though. because I and I, I, I our uh producer Greg brings up Snowfall, and I will say this. Which he has not seen also. So Greg hasn't seen it. I'm currently watching Snowfall, about halfway through the second season. I'm currently watching it. Very good show. Very right. good show so far. It is not the wire. It doesn't have to be the wire. I already can say it is not as good as the wire. Um, it is a very good show, very entertaining. Some overlap, some similar stuff. I think Brian will watch it and say the same thing to me. I thoroughly enjoy this. It doesn't have to be that. I, I don't think that's fair to Snowfall. Snowfall could be its own thing, and it's really good. But someday somebody will make something that I see, and I'm like, this is better than the wire, and I'm, that's fine. It's okay. Hmm. It's 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 okay to do that. Maybe somebody will come along. I think there is a long gap, like Brian says, that will be better than Wayne Gretzky. Somebody will be there. A lot of people thought it could have been Sidney Crosby. Mm. That was a 
I don't know if I see. Yeah, that's the one. That's the that's one, the one person. Think anybody's gonna come along and be better than Wayne Gretzky? That's the one. Listen, man, he had two thousand eight hundred something points or whatever throughout the course of his career. Like that's the one dude where I'm looking around like, uh, I'm not sure who's gonna be able to top it. Because if I go through the other sort of, uh, you know, sports or whatever, like I can see another Amanda Nunez at some point, you know, coming along in MMA. I could see another. Believe it or not, LeBron James or Michael Jordan coming along in basketball. We'll see. Uh, we'll we'll see. You know what I mean? People didn't think there'd be another Michael Jordan. Then, while well, LeBron James is not Michael Jordan stylistically, he is you know a player on that level. Uh, a lot of people would say, right? Like, if I'm if I'm looking at like all these other sort of sports, and this goes back to how we started this in terms of the gaps or whatever, like you know. We can't act like we're not going to see somebody as good as Tom Brady because Tom Brady hasn't been the best quarterback in the NFL since I don't know when. It just so happens that, you know, he wins more and people do the rings thing when in football in order to win, it doesn't take one person. It takes uh, a lot it more than any other sport, probably, perhaps. Right. And baseball, as great as you are, it only helps you. But so much like right. one of the we, best. We One of the best baseball pitcher. players I've ever seen was Ken Griffey Jr. And he yep. doesn't my, have a World Series. My, and my, that's not his fault. Nope. My You're one base- person in a nine-man lineup. My favorite <laughs> my favorite baseball player that I have grown up is absolutely Ken Griffey. I could argue this is going to piss some people off that don't like steroids. But probably the best player I've ever seen <laughs> is Barry Bonds. Like, Barry Bonds is the best player I've ever seen. Like, baseball player I've ever seen. Right, like, and I'm only gonna talk about what I've seen. I understand what I've talked to old heads about Willie Mays, and Willie Mays was 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 great. There's no doubt. I can only say what I've seen from what I've seen. Barry Bonds, how he can hit, steal, yeah. and the power he had late, which probably was for juicing. I understand all that, <laughs> but if you even want to talk pre when you think he saw steroids or pre when you saw his head getting bigger, I was gonna say before the big head. <laughs> yeah. Do do that like his numbers before that. He's a Hall of Famer, like he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, <laughs> this, this, this guy could steal bases, had the speed, gold glove. In his youth, when he's playing for Pittsburgh, great arm playing, uh, playing in right. Like, yo, th- th- this dude was one of the best players. And Griffey too. Griffey yeah. just didn't have the supporting cast. He never really had a good pitching team, pitching situation when he was in Seattle or Cincinnati. And but he, he would of, always produce, so it's like, what can you do? What's sad yeah. with him is like, if you look at his injuries, you're like, oh, he might have had his, he might have had the home run record, but injuries is what cost him, a lot, him a lot of that. He probably would have had the home run record, but yeah, he's somebody you needed to see at play in his prime, and as great as he was defensively and offensively, where you're talking about gold glove and hitting, the power, the speed, the arm. He's probably he, he's probably the best I've seen. Uh, yeah, and so. But yeah, the baseball is a lot about the numbers and what you've seen, and it's debatable when it comes to hitters. And then you got pitchers and pitching a lot. You know, the best I've seen is fucking Pedro Martinez. Pedro (laughs) Martinez, peak Pedro Martinez is the best pitcher I saw at his peak in a very short time. I'm not sure he's the best pitcher I've ever watched ever. But yeah, yeah, but his peak, like, but like Roy Jones Jr. to me is the second best athlete of the 1990s, his peak, after Michael Jordan. And Pedro Ooh. Martinez is probably, like, right there somewhere. Pedro was great, man. Pedro was great. He he won't – this is what – see, and th- this is one of the things about things changing that it's interesting to me, about how we look at sports, how we look at athletes. You know, baseball is starting to shift, which I like the way people are actually looking at the numbers, especially around pitching. Because I always hated that people act like wins was such a big thing. And what yeah. I'm I'm bringing this up in terms of Pedro, and I think a lot of people will see where I'm going. Pedro, one of the knocks people even had about his Hall of Fame candidacy, was like, oh, well, he didn't reach 300 wins. You know, you had these benchmark things you had to reach in baseball in order for it to say that you're a Hall of Famer. But I'm like, look, if you look at, as our man Gerard would like to be always say, look at the advanced numbers, right? Look at the advanced numbers in terms of baseball with Pedro. You look at his whip. And his strikeout per nine inning ratio, and you forget the wins. If you look at his late years with the Expos and early years with the Red Sox, <laughs> yeah. And like, if you don't believe the numbers, because baseball is a one-on sports where you can really look at the numbers and they can tell you the tale. 
forget the wins. Don't look at the wins. But if you go watch some video yeah. of this dude <laughs> in that era, go look it up. Go on YouTube. You have access to do this. Go look it up and look at the fear he put in hitters. Look at how that fastball was moving. Pop. Yeah. You didn't know what to do. He was freezing people. He had the power. He, he could hit the edge of the plate and work both sides. And then you saw how the brilliance of Pedro, I think it should also be noted, when pitchers don't have the same stuff that they had early on in their career. This is what adds to the greatness for me, B. When they don't got that same pop, but then they find a way and they can adjust and still pitch effectively without the power, as we saw late in his career with the Mets, he was not the same guy, but he still had greatness where he could still give you six innings and be like, yo, you're not going to hit him. That's greatness. That's, I, th- I think he might have made an all-star team with the Mets, no? He did, I believe he did one year. He did one year with the Mets. And he was like 34, 35 or something at that time. One of my favorites of all time by far. Pitching is so hard, man. There's so many great ones I've seen. Randy Johnson. Yeah, um, I, I did it a couple times. It was not fun. I did get a save once, though, in Little League. Oh, my God. Here we go. Oh, I wasn't so, a good pitcher. I was a middle team. infielder. <laughs> Well, well, okay, yeah. I, two I with that. the Mets, so five and oh six. Oh, five and oh six. Yeah. What? Yeah, he made two with the Mets. Okay. It was wow. good in those years. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, we could talk about goats all day. This is at least an inter- interesting topic. Let us know if you agree. Do you think the gap between Wayne Gretzky uh and everybody else in hockey is as big? Is there any other sport that maybe we're not talking about? Where there isn't a big gap for GOAT. I mean, I do think there's a gap in women's tennis with Serena. There's a big, big debate you could have in wrestling, either amateur or professional, especially professional. But that's more subjective. We can get into that another time. We are. I'm going to have to hit up our our last guest, Dan Surf, and ask him who he thinks is the GOAT wrestler. It's very, listen, I told you my criteria. Who do you think most people think is the GOAT wrestler? Like the, the average person, if you pull them on the street, that's a wrestling fan. Who were they saying is, is the greatest of all time wrestling? Because I feel like what I knew it was when I was growing up, like people always had Hulk Hogan as the GOAT. Right, and I think that to... shifted I think that shifted okay. completely over to Ric Flair. I think most people would say it's Ric Flair, and I understand why. You know what I mean? I understand why. I don't know what the younger demographic would say, hmm. because uh, although Ric Flair has sort of like resonated with, you know, Bad Bunny and Quavo and like he stepped into the culture and shit like that. Like he's still somebody who's very relevant today. People want to party with him. He was on the trailer card with Jake Paul, uh, you know, when, on the Jake Paul card and things like that. Like people still want Ric Flair. I'm not sure how many of these people have seen him wrestle when he was right. going for like an hour in 1980s with Dusty Rhodes and Ricky Steamboat and things like that. But in terms of the total package, in terms of like the performance, the mic work, the the believability and like all those sort of things wrapped into one, I feel like it's got to be Ric Flair or Shawn Michaels. But we can, you know, discuss that another time. And Stone Cold had the best peak. Stone Cold and The Rock probably had the best peak. See, I thought those guys were going to make in the conversation because I could see – there's certain people to me, Stone Cold is the number one peak ever. It's just kind of like Roy Jones Jr. You wish it lasted longer, but you know he got injured, and then things like that happened. But yeah, he but his- un- undisputed best peak ever because he won. You could or you would even go as far as to say he saved the company because you know they took the Monday Night Wars back from WCW. But at the time where wrestling was at its highest, at the time that people of like your age, Dexter, Dexter, still remember and are yep. very fond of that period from yep. 1997 to like 2001. Yep. All my, he all was, my high school years. All my high school years. He was the guy. He all was people, the guy during that entire yep. period, and The Rock was right. right he was there. 1B. All, all people went around school were saying Stone Cold statements, people in 316 shirts, do you smell what they're cooking, jabroni this, jabroni that. Yeah, I remember yeah. that in high school. 97, that's my high school years, 97 to 2001. If, if you're the, I, I feel like that. if you're the best player or the best athlete or the best whatever of the best era of whatever that was, then that that's your case. Because Ma- Magic Johnson and Larry Bird get credited for like the 80s, the 80s. or whatever, yep. because before Michael Jordan came along, like that was sort of like, is it Kareem? Is it Magic? Is it Bird? And then in the 90s, it's a, era of basketball that we romanticize now and michael jordan was the king that entire time yeah i mean a lot of it is and those people like even in wrestling you mentioned all the guys you mentioned you can think and know their impact on the sport even if you wasn't a wrestling fan it was hard to get away from that so you could that's really the mark of somebody's impact where you know how they touch you so let us know who's a goat do not let us know who you think is the boat because we do not care about anybody talking about the damn boat a boat is a boat something on water 
Not a best of all time. What is that? Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. One time for your mind, we haven't got to do this in a while, but we're back with some interesting stuff. And interestingly enough, this week, the topics that Brian and I will both talk about involve violence in ways that we probably did not want to talk about. Uh, and Brian has something that involves something very saddening, actually, uh, around mm-hmm. the world of boxing, and particularly uh, from a boxer mm-hmm. from his home country of Puerto Rico. Uh, Brian, I'll let you start with that before I get into uh, people behaving badly across the pond. What you got? In 2015, uh, I first heard about, or rather 2014, actually, I first heard about this fighter named Felix Verdejo, as a lot of people did. I had vaguely known of him from like the Olympics in 2012, but in 2014 is when he won ESPN prospect of the year, top ranked prospect of the year. You had a feeling he was next up. Dan Raphael from ESPN at the time was writing a whole bunch of things about him. Um, And then Felix Trinidad meets him. It's a big deal. Like this is supposed to be next. And this is around the time where Miguel Cotto is sort of stepping, you know, out the door and he ends up retiring in 2017. And then it's like, it's right there for Felix Verdejo to sort of carry the mantle in Puerto Rican boxing. And if you guys know, I mean, if you've seen La Cultura piece that we've talked about up here and something that we've did and how much that matters to Puerto Ricans, uh, boxing is something that is a staple. When you think about sports on the Island, you think about boxing, baseball and basketball. And Felix Verdejo was supposed to be somebody who was next in that lineage of being a, a world champion and all of those things, not just a world champion, but a superstar, right? So Thursday, or rather Friday, I see on my phone that he's being questioned for uh, his potential involvement with this missing woman in Puerto Rico named Kesla, uh, Kesla, um, Kesla Rodriguez Ortiz is her full name. Um, Kesla Marlon Rodriguez Ortiz. And she uh, had been missing since Thursday. Authorities questioned Felix Verdejo, and he basically was, uh, you know, not really cooperating with the investigation at the advice of his lawyer. Come to find out Saturday, um, Kesla's found dead, and Felix has to talk. And she's found dead in a lake uh, in San Juan somewhere. I forget the lake's name. Um, I had written a story on Sunday that I ended up rearranging a little bit Monday morning before it went up. It's a column on Latino Rebels about this. So you can check that out. Shout out to past guest Julio Ricardo Varela, who sort of set that up also. So, um, you know, I ended up writing about the Verdejo thing and just how, like in watching him over the years, He's always been somebody you expected more from, and he's always been kind of a, not kind of, he's always been a disappointment because he would have these moments that would give you sort of hope as a fighter, and then he would have these moments where it's like he would come up short, he had a lackluster performance, he still won, but it was barely a a good decision for him, all these sort of things. And then what happens is he eventually loses in a fight in 2018, which I talked about in the piece where I was going to build a feature story around him. And then he ended up losing. So I had to sort of change my idea or whatever. I had met him, interviewed him the whole time, the whole thing. And then he lost in 2019. Um, or no, he didn't lose in 2019. He had a lackluster win when he returned in 2019. And then in 2021, uh, 2020, rather late December, excuse me, he lost again in a fight that he was, um, supposed to be very good in. And look, I read the sort of details and that's what was really jarring about this because Kesla uh, was a woman he was involved with. Felix was 27 years old, about to be 28 in May. 
Kessler was 27 when she was found dead and pregnant with their child, uh, one month pregnant. So basically the criminal complaint says this, and I'm going to read this. This is from Andrea Gonzalez Ramirez, who, uh, you know, apparently this was reported that Felix contacted the victim, arranged to meet near her residence. Um, there was something about a, a black Dodge Durango SUV. And if you Google Felix, there's pictures of him with this Dodge Durango or whatever. Um, following a conversation between Felix and the victim, it says that he punched the victim in the face, injected her with a syringe uh, filled with substances purchased from a drunk point. Um, he and the witness then, he and the witness, because there was another person in there, he and the witness then restrained the victim's arms and feet with a wire. A block was tied to the victim. The witness took the keys uh, from the victim and, um, you know, boarded the Kia and then they threw her off the bridge. And then he apparently also, for whatever reason, shot at her body once. Um, and that's pretty much what happened. Uh, FBI was looking for him and then Sunday night he turned himself in. So that's going on right now. And I just want to say, like, you know, this is already one of the most disappointing athletes in my lifetime because of who he was supposed to be and who he was not. Now you're talking about somebody who's just, you know, a dude who, while married, by the way, to another woman with a child, uh, kills this other woman and that he was involved with. And it just doesn't make any sense. And you always and you always wonder, like, why, among other things, but you also wonder, like, and my main question would be, like, dude, what did you think was going to happen? Like, instead of just sort of dealing with this because you messed up and sort of, you know, taking care of two different families or whatever, the decision was that you disregarded her life so much that you just decided to end it at 27 years old. You know, I'm 27. My girlfriend's about to be 27. Like, this hit me in a very specific way where I'm like, you know, I can't even imagine all the sort of collateral things that are going on here. So look, if you want to read the piece that I wrote about him being a fucking failure, you can read that on Latino Rebels, but it's not really about that. It's also about just the rise in sort of domestic violence on the island. Uh, there was a state of, the, of, of emergency declared for Puerto Rico in January about domestic violence against women, which activists have been pushing for for a long time. So hopefully we can just do better. I don't know what else to really yeah, say. Yeah, I, I had the same question you had, which is what did he think was going to happen? And also the person who helped him, what did they think was going to happen? Uh, and, and and I understand people will about ride or die, be there for their friends, but for that? Like the idea to do that and to do this with one of your friends and the it shows you, as you said, Brian, the lack of respect he had for this woman. I mean, to take somebody's life when your life is not in danger uh, because she's pregnant with your child and whatever transpired that, you know, my, my heart goes out to that woman and her family. Um, and this is why women are speaking out against domestic violence, because things can escalate to things like this. We've seen this with other athletes. This is why women are afraid a lot. This is the fear that they have, that these things can even happen. Um, and, you know, his boxing career on this, and, I'm, and much that Brian wrote about it in the piece on Latino Rebels is secondary here. Uh, the disappointment he's been and all that, that, that is secondary here. Uh, a woman lost her life, a family lost a daughter, a uh, potential child uh, never come to this world, a mother never gets to raise that child. Um, so, you know, I don't think you have to be a parent. You don't have to be uh, the same age. You don't have to be Puerto Rican. This, this hits home if you care about humanity and what is done right. And it is a despicable, obviously, act by Felix Verdejo. Verdejo. And um, I, I believe Brian wrote in the piece, he can face up to the death penalty uh, in, in Puerto yeah, Rico. Yeah, he might, he, might, he might be eligible for the death penalty. penalty. And no matter what you feel about that or how you feel about the death penalty, um, you know, he's, he's going to be prosecuted, hopefully to the fullest extent of the law. He was already and, denied bail, too. I don't know what justice that family is going to get. Uh, and I don't think there's any justice that could bring their daughter back. But it, it, I have no other words to say, but it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. And, and, and I also want to point out there's something I pointed out in the piece as well, because it's something I didn't even know prior. But um, so I, I don't know the extent of the relationship portion of it, but apparently he had been linked to her some way for like 11 years. And she mm. even had 
his nickname was El Diamante. Those and she, she had a tattoo. She had the she had a diamond tattoo dedicated to him on her back. And that's how it was identified that her family members knew it was her. So. And which is sad enough. And when, you know, men treat women like they're disposable, which is literally what he did here, literally what he did here. And that is not to make fun of it. I'm just saying this is how it escalates when we don't value women and this is the way we treat them. You just treat them like they're disposable. Their life is disposable and there's no care or regard. And that's, that's what's truly disgusting to me in this story it's not just a sports story but it's a it's a human issue story domestic violence that continues to go on and plague women across the world not just this country across the world um and it's it's, it's truly sad but check out brian's piece on latino rebels uh re- really really good one um and he's got a lot more good work coming up on that platform um across the pond sunday as many people know i'm a big soccer fan a uh, fan of liverpool sat down on Sunday because they were playing Manchester United. Liverpool, not been a greatest year. You know, we are the uh, reigning English Premier League champions. Uh, it's not going to happen this year, currently sitting in sixth. But if we had won this match, which we still have a chance to get up to fourth to be still eligible for Champions League, um, Manchester City would have won the title. Uh, so this was a match and important for many different reasons. But I, I, I woke up, I was sitting down, trying to watch the match around noon, uh, here Eastern time in, in the States. And then I noticed the match had been postponed because of protests that had been going on. I should say protests that had been going on um, in Manchester. The game was at Old Trafford, obviously historic site where Manchester United plays. Manchester United, one of the biggest football teams, soccer teams in the world. Um, they are owned by the Glazer family out of Florida. It's been known for some time. If you don't know soccer and EPL, the fan base of Manchester United, they haven't been happy with their ownership. Now, some of you may have seen what happened with the Super League a couple of weeks ago and how that all went down and came quickly and didn't. The cliff notes on that is people tried to form a league with all these major teams and they tried to Americanize the sport, right, and putting the best teams all together and having these TV deals and all this stuff. And the fans of all these teams were like, nah, not going to happen, right? People in England particularly take their soccer very seriously very, very seriously. Now, to some degree, I respect all that because I like the fact that the fans will hold the ownership accountable and put their proverbial feet to the fire to hold them accountable for this stuff. Sometimes I wish that would happen here in the States and it doesn't. I've always said, long said this, if your team sucks, if your ownership sucks, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, you know what you got to do? You know, you hold their feet to the fire. You don't got to show up at the games. You don't got to watch their games. This is what I've done for a long time. You don't like what your owners are doing? Don't buy it. Don't go to the games. You don't have to go to the games. When you go to the games, they don't care as much because their pockets are getting aligned whether they win or lose. And our producer, uh, our producer Greg, mentions the Knicks. Yes, that's one of the teams I would have experience in doing that with. However, on Saturday at Old Trafford, Manchester United, the fans, they had enough. They had everything that went down with the Super League. They don't like the way the team's being run. Manchester United hasn't had as much great success in the last uh, decade or so. They've seen their rivals, Man City, have more success. Looks like they're about to win their third EPL title in four years. So all this stuff has been going on. And these fans decided to storm Old Trafford. Apparently some fans got into the stadium and into the locker room. (laughs) And this was very, you know, I watched this. I was watching the images. I'm watching this on TV. And I stopped for a second and said, ah, oh, this reminds me of something. <laughs> this reminds me of something. I've seen this before. And it wasn't around sports. Like the people looked the same. Maybe they had a little bit different stuff. Maybe they didn't have, maybe they didn't have red flags that said uh, make America great again. They didn't have that, right? But the, it, it was pretty much the same thing. There was stuff that was fighting with police officers, police officers who were injured. There were like flames being thrown. All this other stuff, right, from the United supporters who were angry against the Glazer family. And obviously, I'm referring to what happened on January 6th at our nation's capital. And people who felt like they had enough, felt like the election had been stolen from them, decided to storm the Capitol. But I wondered the same thing watching this when I was watching that. What did y'all expect to do once you got in there? 
Right? right. Once you get into Old Trafford, what were you going to do and what was that going to show the Glazer family? If you deface the stadium, Glazer family's got enough money, they'll just fix that back up. It's like if 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 Mets fans were so angry, we we have competent ownership now, but if they were so angry in a storm city field, one, it's wild to me that that could even occur. If anybody's been to a lot of American stadiums, if you want to try to get in, you won't get in. Like it's not going to happen. Word. Okay. It's not going to happen. I once at my previous employer did a stand up in the parking lot of MetLife Stadium. And I was probably half a mile away from the actual stadium. And somebody called the cops. Now, a lot of that probably happened because of the color <laughs> of my skin. No doubt about that. But that just goes to show you, you're not even going to get close to getting in the stadium. So I don't know what these fans thought they were doing. And what's amazing in this was a lot of these fans who don't look like myself or Brian, nothing happened for them. These cops, even in the UK, had incredible restraint. And I think watching these images, when you see this on January 6th, what happened in our capital, what happened in Manchester United, what people could unite for. It's like, man, if y'all united against, we talked about this earlier, if people gather to protest against domestic violence, if people gather to protest against, I don't know, racism, maybe other human rights things that was that serious, instead of just over a football team, y'all could show that much energy because you think Manchester United is not being run right. And I'm not saying that they're wrong for that. But y'all showing up and you're storming the stadium? For what? What's going to happen when you do it? You know how you get the Glazer family to pay attention to you? Don't go to Old Trafford. Don't go pay the ticket prices to go watch United play. That is, you got to hit them where the dollars hurt. And I don't understand why people don't understand that in terms of real change. But you know what it is? The people that all look the same at Old Trafford, that look the same as they did at the Capitol building, they're very much aware of their privilege. They're very much aware that they can roll up there, storm a stadium or federal building, and nothing will happen to them. And it doesn't matter. What, this is when people say, stick to sports. No, 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 no. Sports and this stuff always intersects, right? You can't get away from it. You can't hide from it. It always intersects. That privilege will show up for sports fans. It'll show up for American citizens. And it'll show time and time again. And I'm just here to say, stop being corny. You don't have to be corny like this all the time. You don't have to do the, do this. And can we stop giving these folks that look that way the benefit of the doubt when they do illegal stuff like storm into stadiums or federal buildings? Come on. Come on. And please, people, bring some of that energy to something better, something better that you could fight. So, Brian, I don't know about you. I know sometimes you're team violence, but uh, I don't know if you've <laughs> ever had any thoughts about storming a stadium because I haven't. No, as as much as as much as I have love for uh, or have have loved certain teams throughout the course of my life, and still uh, am a Mets fan. No, I, I would never rise uh, to that level of passion. I guess if you want to call it that, <laughs> not for that, and not for really anything necessarily that I could think about uh, that could get me to like storm something. At least, I mean. You know, it would have to be something that directly affects me as opposed to just, you know, faceless dudes that I just happen to care about the uniform they wear. Yeah, so, it, it, it was disappointing. There was a lot of uh, stuff. Like if somebody owed dude. me money, well, you know, like uh, that's a different thing. I might storm more than just that. You know what I'm saying? But hopefully it won't it won't be that case. I, I get it. I get it. The Glazer family, obviously, people know from Florida, own the Buccaneers. I understand it. The, people, the folks in England don't want their sports to be Americanized, and I support them in that. I really do. But, you know, a lot of times what's funny is, and this is what I'll end on with this conversation, a lot of times when we've seen black and brown people protest against civil rights and be very angry and things escalate, oftentimes we are told that is not the way. That's the thing we're always told. There's a better way for you guys to go about this. I haven't seen one person say, hey, there's a better way for these fans to go about it. And we also saw a lot of people not say there was a better way for people to go about whatever the hell they thought they were doing on January 6th. You, you ask yourself what the difference in that is. I, it's pretty clear to me. It's, it's, it's the color of the skin of the majority of the people that are up there doing these kinds of protests. It's pretty, it's pretty clear to me for that. All right, that's it for this edition of One Time for Your Mind. That's it for this episode of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. Uh, thank you again, as always, for your support. We have a lot of great content, some new content coming really soon uh, out of Backpack Broadcasting. Uh, Brian also will have some 
new content coming really soon, really soon, sooner than you think. Uh, we talked about it before, but that will be coming up. Uh, please continue to follow us on all social media platforms. Uh, sub hit the subscribe button on Backpack Bro Broadcasting. Also check out our Patreon page. Uh, that's it, as I said again, for this episode 176 of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. For our great producer, Gregory Alcala, who was a little bit hyped about the Knicks being the four seed, and we'll see if they can keep that up. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Sure.